Yeah, as a Renmin Ma, as my colleague. So I was very proud of a uh, Renmin, uh, because I know him when he was uh, staying in Berkeley. Right, that time you are pastor in Berkeley in Xiang's group. Uh, he already published a very nice paper on nature and science. So that time I met him, I say, okay, yeah, please come back. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we really need someone. You know, very active, energetic, and so on do these light things. So, uh, after Professor Ma come back to PKU, he really developed a lot of new things and win. A lot of titles, honors, and uh, uh, many, many new technology was came from his uh, group. Today he is going to talk about some story of uh, electronic lasing and uh, field manipulation and the micro scale and also nano scale. Uh, Professor Ma, stage is yours, the world is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your warm introduction, uh, Alice. So I also would like to thank you. Uh, and uh, also Miss uh, Bai Yu Hong for kind of um, inviting me to participate in this great event to celebrate the 60 year uh, anniversary of this leader invention. So hi everyone, so my name is Demi Ma. So today I will share uh, with you some of, our, uh, some of our recent research on leading at the uh, micro scale, also some related about uh, this kind of field manipulation at the micro scale. So, um, so this is the first laser invented by uh, Mayban, so I show here. It's a kind of a, a small device. Actually, uh, this one on newspapers are uh, uh, much larger, actually. So this is because the journalist asked Mayman, so let's take a picture for our newspaper. And uh, Mayman uh, took up this small laser, a real device that can work, but uh, the journalist felt it's too small, something too trivial. So ask him, do you have something uh, larger? So they say, okay, I have this one, but it does not work. But not does not matter, we like something larger. So this is the first paper published by Mayman uh, in 1960 in Nature. It's a very short paper. So it's a kind of in total less than one page. This is the Charles uh, Thomas uh, comments on this paper. He said that uh, Mayman's paper is so short and it has so many powerful ramifications that I believe it might be considered the most important per word of any of the wonderful papers in Nature over the past century. So soon after the invention of the laser, it has shown it's so powerful in modern science and the technology. Number, as we already discussed, the number of Nobel Prize are awarded to laser-related uh, kind of science. And also uh, so many uh, modern technologies are using laser as a driving um, force. So the first laser we can see, we can consider it as a localization of light in frequency. So this is the spectrum from our sun. So it's a kind of a black body radiation. The temperature is about the uh, uh, six thousand Kelvin. So comparing to this kind of the first laser, we can see this much broader, there's no directionality and also the low optical power density to make a very simple comparison, you know, like uh, to reach the same power level of um, one millivolt laser with a line width of gigahertz. A summer light needed to be heated to 10 to 11 Kelvin. It's an extremely high temperature. So we can see like how a small laser uh, can be this kind of so powerful. So after the six years of development, we can do extreme localization of this kind of electromagnetic field now. Simply like we can express like this light field like as E equals to A times E I K X minus omega T. A is amplitude, K is momentum, X is position, omega frequency, and T is time. So we can do the extreme localization in every parameter of this kind of like, uh, expression of the light field. So if we can localize the light in amplitude, like say in intensity, we can do this uh, so powerful uh, laser as the National Ignition for City tried to do. They tried to control the nuclear fusion like a uh, technology like uh, bring star power to the earth. So the K is momentum. It's not a represent, only represent the wavelength, also represent the directionality. So if we can have extreme localization in momentum, we can do this so long distance uh, communication like uh, from satellite to the earth and also like even from moon to the earth. The omega is the frequency. You can we have a very stable frequency, extreme localization in frequency. We can do this kind of highly price precision this environment like the LIGO tried to do, like we can and right now uh, detect a 10 to 
minus uh, 12, like um, 18 like meter level detection, like to detect a gra uh, gravitational like, wave. And the time, T is the time, I think, uh, we have now like uh, ultra short laser in our lab, and also people are, can try to this out of second laser. And this is so fast that they can, uh, can now detect the inner shell electron movement. And the last parameter is X, X is the position of the wave. So it's not like I perform other parameters, but we can localize the light view in real space. We can do small layers. A small layers, as already uh, Professor Brimberg already introduced, is so powerful in our modern life for this communication, computing, and uh, so many things. And also right now, like uh, for this kind of face uh, recognition, also like a uh, atomic uh, clock, this kind of applications. So today I will share with you some uh, of our research in this topic. So to control the light in macro scale to make a new type of lasers based on it. So the first part I will to talk about is revealing the mission dimension at an exception point. It's a kind of a new type of light and the matter interaction. And then later I will talk about a topological bulk laser. I think this can be potentially, potentially be a competitor uh, with the Vixel. It's also a surface emitting laser, but without the DVR laser uh, mirrors. So last uh, part of my talk, I will discuss the plasmonic analysis and uh, also the phase and the potential applications of this kind of laser. So the first part is talking about this kind of uh, uh, revealing the mission dimension at some point. So what do I mean? So I would like to share with you some of uh, the kind of history of a spontaneous emission. So spontaneous emission is everywhere. We like shine uh, our world. So, but uh, naturally, like uh, the light we receive every day is about the kind of black body radiation, mainly about the spontaneous emission, actually. So we, to describe uh, the spontaneous emission of black body radiation, we have this Green's distribution law, religious uh, law, and the Planck's law. In 1900, Planck derived this uh, Planck's law and uh, fit this kind of uh, experimentally uh, made black body radiation very well. And uh, five years later, Einstein made this uh, light quantum hypothesis. So he made it, uh, he stated like, uh, in accordance with the assumption to be considered here, the energy of a light ray spreading out from a point source is not continuously distributed over an increasing space, but it consists of a finite number of energy quanta, which are localized at points in space, which you move without dividing. So it's a kind of a, a, this consumption, but uh, at that time it's kind of a, a big a concept jump. So in, even in like a 12 years later, so Einstein commented and said, I don't doubt anymore the reality of radiation quanta, although I still stand quite alone in this uh, conviction. Um, in 1960, Einstein made this paper discussing the, uh, his uh, method to derive Planck's law. So in his this paper, he said like uh, Planck accomplished this by deriving based upon electromagnetic consideration, considerations, a relation between radiation density and random energy. So he commented that like Planck's deviation was, one, was of unparalleled boldness, but found the brilliant confirmation. So in this paper, in um, Einstein's this brilliant paper, so he got this very simple deviation from the kind of uh, this balance of thermal equilibrium of uh, emission and absorption process to get uh, like uh, the Planck's law and uh, very interesting. So, so he made this somewhat equally uh, with them, uh, state and derived that. So if say, if there is no so-called stimulated emission and we get a Wilhelm's law and if uh, we have stimulated emission, we will have Planck's law. And uh, he also get this uh, spontaneous emission over stimulated emission, this kind of like emission rate uh, ratio like uh, called Einstein relationship. So here, he not only, for us, he not only derived the Planck's law to explain the black body relation, but more profoundly, like he got the idea, there is another emission process, so-called stimulated emission. That's the base of the latest invention. So I want to say a few, uh, one, a few uh, more words than uh, on spontaneous emission. So we know there is a stimulated absorption. There is a photon at the low energy level. And uh, there's an electron here. And the photon coming up here and excited this uh, electron to the upper level. So this is, sounds very natural. 
And also we have this stimulated emission like uh, uh, proposed by uh, Einstein. So that is the one photon come here, they trigger the jump of the one electron from the up level to the low level. And you get a pair of uh, the, uh, uh, the same uh, identical photons. But how about the spontaneous emission? We have an electron on the up level. And uh, how it jumps, why it jumps? So that's the reason of the spontaneous emission, like another very important concept based on this. So I called, I called it here, the importance of the black body problem in the development of a quantum theory is recognized by every serious student of a modern physics. What is not so widely known is that black body theory led also to the concept of zero point energy, which was later to appear naturally in the mathematics of a quantum theorem. So what this tells us, this means like something needed to trigger the spontaneous emission process. This is the concept is very important to control the emission process. And in, two, uh, in 1946, um, um, so Poseidon made this very pioneer uh, seminal work about uh, this kind of a Poseidon effect, now we call it. So he said the emission process is not uh, only uh, an intrinsic merits or properties of, a, of the emitter by itself, but also it can control by the photonic environment and it can be accelerated, also can be suppressed. Literally people found that. So this right now well-known Poseidon effect, if we put a, an emitter into a cavity and the emission rate will be proportional to the quality factor of the cavity and also inversely proportional to the physical volume of that uh, uh, cavity. So we can control the emission process. And this is a very powerful uh, source like uh, to control, to get a, a variety of uh, uh, physical, like uh, optical physics to control the emission process. So here I listed uh, some of the most recently, de recently developed optical physics for controlling this states of a photon or the emission process, including this kind of whisper, whispering gallery mode as a photonic phase mode, metal materials, variable parallel cavity, the metal surfaces, and also plasmonics, topological photonics, and the PD symmetry. And all of these physical uh, optical physics for control the state of a, a photon are based on a notion that, so like uh, the emitter uh, interacting with the uh, eigen mode of a photonic uh, uh, cavity. So this is so powerful, like a, like a, a, a paradigm to consider the whole uh, emission process. But usually what we are now doing is like we construct a photon eigenstate and by this kind of a, uh, cavity engineering. And then we put an emitter to interact with them. And then we can solve everything like uh, to get the properties of this emitter, to make a single photon uh, emitter, to make a laser and so on and so forth. So the question we asked is, so is there any exceptions to that? So, so does the emitter like uh, have to interact like uh, with the, the photon eigenstate to can we find something new? So we tried like a very simple case to study this. So think about this, a very simple ring cavity. And in this side, the, inside of this very simple ring cavity, there are two generator modes at a random the frequency. It's a counterclockwise propagating wave and the clockwise propagating wave. So if we put a emitter inside of this cavity, uh, unreadened, and then we will excite both of this mode because of a symmetry. And then we get the, the superposition of this CW mode and the CCW mode. What we get is an standing wave inside the cavity. So this is not a surprise at all. And then like what we thought is, so how about we eliminate one of the eigen mode at this random frequency inside this cavity. Let's say we eliminate the CW mode. And there's only one CCW mode left in that, inside this cavity. So how does the emitter interact with the an electron magnetic, magnetic environment with this kind of incomplete eigenbasis? At the beginning, we saw we it's related to the remained eigenstate because this is already the only eigenstate of the Hamiltonian of the system. So we try to, first we try to construct such kind of a electron magnetic environment. So we utilize this so-called party time symmetric modulation. So we modulated the real part of our refractive index and as well as imaginary part of refracting index inside of this cavity in this kind of a, a format, like uh, with a, a kind of a two pi, pi over two, this phase shift between these two parts of a refracting index modulation. And we 
then can solve the couple mode equations in this uh, cavity on remnant for of this CCW mode and CW mode. And we can get the eigenfrequencies and eigenstates. And you can see that if the uh, amplitude of this modulation are same to each other, we can get this kind of uh, like a degenerate in eigenfrequency. And unsurprisingly, that we can also get the kind of eigenstates coalesce at an extreme point. That means like uh, at the extreme point or like uh, this uh, data ni equals to data ni, we get only one eigenstate in the system. That's the only, let's say, CCW uh, mode left in the system. This is so-called uh, exception point and well studied in like uh, non-hermitian physics. So this is a phase diagram for this kind of uh, parity time symmetric uh, like a system. We will have this part of parity time symmetric uh, phase and this parity time symmetry broken phase and at the intersection we will have this so-called extreme point. At this point, both the eigenfrequency get degenerated. And also you can see this, uh, the evolution of eigenstates versus this parameter. And initially, like I say, there's no uh, modulation. You will have two eigenstates, I say, you like a space are two dimensional. But at this extreme po point, this two dimensional space clasp claps to one dimensional space. So right now, then we put this double emitter to interact with this uh, left uh, CCW mode over there. And uh, when we get the simulation, full real simulation results, we get a uh, very spiced, like uh, the mode we will not couple to this CCW mode, but couple to the like uh, eliminated CW mode of the system. So we call it this kind of um, Jordan vector based relation because this limited uh, dimension is uh, mathematically uh, people name it Jordan vector. So basically, the fix on uh, underline is that uh, you have two eigenstates. I mean, although it seems the same, but there is a phase before them. So in uh, quantum mechanics, we know that this phase is done no matter this kind of a trivial. But here, like think about it, if you have a minus plus plus field and you excite both, they will disconstructively interface to each other. And then this will, this give us this kind of Jordan vector, uh, like a, a relation process. So it's never found it before, because think about it, let's say if you, um, like uh, the room right now you are staying, this is three dimensional. Think about it, if there is a, a dimension has been eliminated, let's say you only have two dimension over there, it's only that is a wall over there and you put an emitter over there, but naturally we think about the emission, all the emission will stay inside that wall, but uh, it can couple to another dimension that uh, has been eliminated. So this is basically, basically uh, what happened over there. So in a normal cavity, you will excite both uh, CW mode and CCW mode, and then you put the exception point um, inside this cavity, and uh, there will be a degenerated like a uh, um, CCW mode, and you put an emitter over there, you will excite this uh, emission dimension. So this is the story I would like to uh, share with you about this kind of emission dimension at the exception point, how to interact light with it. Also, we are working on to make a nanoscale laser that can have this vortex radiation uh, based on this concept. So the, for the second part, I will talk about uh, another uh, laser device named uh, the topological bulk laser. So as uh, uh, Professor Bimberg already introduced a lot about uh, this kind of vexel, uh, it's invented by uh, Professor uh, Iga uh, in Tokyo. And uh, this is uh, the note from uh, him like uh, in 1977. It's very simple, let's say. Uh, we have an IG emission laser. How about make it uh, like emission vertically? And this is the first publication in 1979. Of course, right now the vessel is uh, a very complex. The basic uh, configuration is like this. So we have actual materials here, and we have DBR lasers on top, and a DBR, a DBR mirror on top, and a DBR mirror uh, on the bottom. So this DBR mirror on the top and bottom give the feedback. And so the emission, the light will uh, propagating and run into uh, like a, a back and forth between this top and the bottom mirrors and will emit eventually uh, vertically. The lateral confinement is uh, introduced by injection uh, like this kind of uh, 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 confinement. And also the index, index contrast give you this uh, lateral long, uh, we call a transverse mode. So here, like a, the problem for, for us is uh, like the device seems uh, like a little bit complicated. We need a, a lot of DBR mirrors over there. Also, the mode is, can be hardly controlled in transverse dimension. 
So we, tr we tried uh, to do this kind of laser. This is so-called a topological bulk laser based on van inversion induced uh, uh, refraction. Actually, this is the SEM image of the device. I don't know if you can see the difference between here in the center of this SEM image and on the side, actually. Actually, they are different. So it looks like the same thing, like the, 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 the triangle nano holes that you uh, driven on this membrane. But actually, here in this uh, uh, area, it's a kind of a topological photonic crystal. Outside, the triple photonic crystal. And the difference between them are very uh, small, tiny. So here is an room end SEM image. You can, maybe, probably you can see the, the difference, but maybe not. So here, like this is a triple photonic crystal. And this is six triangular nano holes in this unit cell of the photonic crystal. They are more close to the center of this unit center. However, here, in this uh, topological photonic crystal, these uh, six nano triangle nano holes are away because they are more close to the edge of the boundaries of this unit cell. So this makes the, a big difference actually. Here the band become, the energy band of the photonic crystal become topological and here it still uh, stay in trivial. And uh, people are in, very interested in this edge state here, but we found like another uh, uh, very interesting properties we can uh, employ, especially for laser. So for this kind of band inversion, we will have this topological uh, cavity, like uh, uh, you can design like this way. So here for triple case, here's the double band and here uh, is the quadruple band. And you can make the band inversed at this band edge make this kind of back band inversion to contrast the, the topological properties of this photonic cross, uh, structure. And at, uh, in between, you can contrast this kind of a topological edge state. But we found that like a very interesting, like because the, here the band are inversed, so the light can be freely propagating like this kind of double mode uh, uh, in this uh, frequency region. But uh, when he hit this uh, interface, get a refracted because here is what he say at this frequency is an quadruple mode. So we call this band inversion induced refraction. The same thing here, but here, the quadruple mode can be freely propagating in this frequency range here in topological photonic crystal, but it, it will get refracted at the boundary because here the propagating mode inside the true photonic crystal is an double mode. And based on this concept, we can construct a, a, a cavity. So here, is the three dimensional full wheel simulated field pattern of these uh, devices. You can see the, there is a true field confinement inside this topological regime. And you can see that inside this is the quadruple mode and outside is the double mode. And it clearly it shows this kind of so-called band inversion induced refraction. And uh, very interestingly, this uh, because of the band inversion only happen around the gamma point. So you will have a strong confinement just uh, at the, around the gamma point. And then when you away from it in frequency, and you will see the Q factor becomes uh, smaller and smaller. So it naturally give us a mode selection mechanism to have a single mode operation the, like uh, devices. And uh, more interestingly, the band inversion only happen around the gamma point. That uh, means the light field propagating here has no like uh, implant momentum. The most of its uh, momentum are vertical. So it uh, give us naturally vertical emission. We do not have uh, the DBR mirror here at all. We just have a very thin uh, semiconductor membrane. We can have this vertical emission well confined in uh, uh, macro scale devices. So here's uh, like, uh, I, I, I got this kind of comments very few. Um, the reviewers say this results are uh, uh, is groundbreaking. Um, the structure is uh, uh, perfectly suited for constructing a uh, directional and high efficient laser. It was uh, beautiful. So this is a, a kind of a cartoon of our device like uh, showing the directional emission from a microscope cavity inside the topological bulk uh, laser. So recently we also utilized this edge mode in between this topological photonic crystal and the triple photonic crystal. But here we use the, utilize this spring momentum locked edge state and the, to demonstrate uh, at the vortex radiation. So um, due to the limited time, I will not to talk too much about the bulk laser and move to the next uh, and the last topic of a plasmonic nano laser. Here we utilize the uh, amplification of a six plasma polaritons to demonstrate a laser at a nanoscale. So here is a brief history of laser miniaturization in the past uh, like uh, four decades, five decades. So initially we have this edgy emitting laser. This ran out uh, 
the main power, power, power force for this uh, long haul like optical telecommunication. And then we have this vexel. And beyond that, we will have this WGM mode and then this photonic crystal nano cavity, you know, a nano laser with uh, like a feature size about a wavelength over two. And uh, beyond that, we cannot uh, amplify photons anymore because of the so-called diffraction limit. The light cannot be confined like uh, in this nanoscale space. So people developed the concept to utilize metallic coating of surface plasmas to confine the light into real nanoscale beyond this so-called diffraction limit. So I show this here. So why is it so difficult to do that? And uh, we know like uh, a few years after the first invention of the laser, people demonstrated this model of the laser. So like kind of a, if we want to have the a localization of our, our, our family sick or like a very short power to the laser, we need a lot of frequencies to do that. And if we do want to do localization in space, actually we want to do, uh, we want a lot of our momentum to like uh, the, to get a superposition of them to get a localization uh, in space. It's very simple, like if I put it this way, like if you want a data function in time and you do the flare transform, you need a lot of frequency components. And here, we want to do the localization in space that we have, we want a data function of the light field or laser field in real space. And then now we do the flare transform, we need a lot of momentum and the, like, we need a very large momentum, and the, but we know like in optical frequency, it's very hard to get a very high refracting index. So that's the problem, like right? we cannot localize the light very well in real space. So here's the cartoon, like uh, usually for laser, like uh, we have like say fiber parallel, like a mirror, and the shortest uh, cavity length is about a wavelength, wavelength over two. So we cannot go beyond it. So this is the so-called diffraction limit uh, more fundamentally by uncertain principle of our photons. So in 2003, David Bogeman and Mark Stockman make a seminal work in this field. The, the, what did they do is they proposed a new kind of a laser. So they call, what do they call it? It's spheres. So for laser, it is the, an echo name of light wave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. For spheres, it's a kind of a, we replace this light wave by six plus one. And now we kind of a, amplify another quantum quanta. So it's kind of another uh, electromagnetic, like a directly a light wave, but with a, a coupled with a free electron oscillation inside a metallic particle on a, a metal uh, or on a interface of a, a dielectric and a metal. So in this way, we can construct a nano, really nanoscale cavity. And if we can amplify this mode, we can get a laser really truly at a nanoscale. So um, when I was a postdoc in Professor Xiangzhang's lab, I, I involved in this kind of laser with them to the uh, early in 2009 to the first uh, nano wide plasma laser. And later we gradually we developed a laser circuit and also room temperature plasma laser and also applied it to like a variety of applications like a sensing, like a for gas phase sensing and for the kind of uh, solution phase uh, refracting index sensing. And most recently, uh, together uh, with collaborated with the Nanjing University, Professor Jasu's group and the Professor Zhu Sunin's group, we demonstrated this sodium-based uh, nano laser. And the sodium is proposed to have a, a lower uh, polysmonic loss than noble metals like silver and uh, gold. And uh, Professor Jasu's group developed very high quality this kind of uh, sodium film. And we made a nano laser based on it and get a kind of a record of performance on this kind of uh, plasmonic nano lasers. So there are, right now, till now, there are so many demonstrations, very beautiful uh, plasmonic nanolasers in one-dimensional confined uh, configuration, two-dimensional confined configuration, and a three-dimensional confined configuration. So as I mentioned earlier, the smallest nanolaser right now people can make is with a diameter of only about a 20 nanometer. It comes with the same feature size as a modern transistor. Like we can put this in like a even cells and to do like a kind of labeling tracking and so on and so forth. So actually, although with this, all this uh, beautiful demonstration, people also still concerned the, the like a loss inside of this uh, plasmonic nano cavity. So on one side, people are fascinated by this kind of field confinement, the capability of the field confinement in this metallic particle. And on the other side, because this confinement has a cost for this parasitic metallic loss. So we are always worried about like a so-called plasmonic nanolasers 
it's only about to make something smaller or like we can do something far beyond like to have a higher performance lower power consumption but there's a lot of debate uh, on this uh, like a question so recently we got a clear i think we think uh, it's become uh, much clearer now like we can really have a lower power consumption and uh, uh, high performance based on this fast morning analysis. So only very brief introduce uh, about this kind of threshold of a laser. And before the threshold, you will have spontaneous emission dominated uh, radiation process. And after this threshold, you will have laser emission. So what can we define this threshold? This is like a, if we, for a conventional laser, I mean, the kink can be obvious because of a different content efficiency between this phase and this phase. But we need to measure the device to know like uh, what is exactly the threshold, especially for nanoscale laser, it can be hardly defined. And uh, also like we need to know a, uh, a certain answer, like where the plasmonics can give us uh, like a lower power consumption or higher. So we need a very uh, much simple um, definition on the threshold. So as I mentioned, like, uh, like the difference between leasing and or not is this kind of spontaneous emission dominant or this leasing emission dominant. So just consider that leasing mode. So what makes the threshold? So we can see, consider like this way, like which is emission is faster and then they can compute for the excited carriers and become a dominant emission inside the laser cavity. So simply the threshold problem becomes a, like a, a comparison between which one is faster. So this Einstein relationship like give us a very simple answer. Like is to have the kind of a, the same emission rate between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission to a certain cavity mode. We just need one real photon, one real photon in this uh, cavity mode, and then stimulated stimulated emission will uh, have the same emission rate as spontaneous emission. So we can define the threshold here. So there's uh, only one photon in the laser mode. And based on this definition, we can get uh, there's uh, two components for uh, like a late uh, threshold. Like, so first one is population inversion. And for normal semiconductor game matrix, we need to pump the, uh, the carriers to the upper level to make the uh, population inversion to make the device, the semiconductor become uh, transparent to make a gain after weight. And the second part is the cavity loss. And, uh, uh, no matter what kind of cavity you made, that's the kind of cavity loss or their gamma C uh, loss rate times uh, photon uh, energy, one photon energy, and uh, times one over beta. Beta means like uh, uh, the fraction, how many photons like the gain emitted can go to the lazy mode. So the, this loss part can be very simple and we can get this kind of a, a simple calculation. For plasmonic, the loss rate is on the order of 10 to 13 to 10 to 14 per second. So this kind of part gives the threshold is about one to 10 megawatt. So that means this uh, threshold is, uh, uh, is very low. And uh, so if we, make an, if we apply this plasmonic to laser, so it uh, only give an additional uh, threshold power about a one to 10 megawatt. It can be even optimized because this is already considered the smallest case, the diameter of the device only 10, uh, about a 10 nanometer. So also, we also experimentally demonstrated, like we make a, a direct comparison between the photonic device and the plasmonic device. And the, uh, we show that the photonic device can be smaller, faster, and low threshold. And I need to highlight, uh, emphasize that this only happens when the size of a device go to the nanoscale. That means like a smaller than one wavelength uh, uh, cubic. And for large device, then photonic device obviously have advantages. But we really, if you really want a physical size smaller than the wavelengths, you will have this kind of advantages from plasmonic effects. So after we published this paper, we got a comment from uh, Mikhail, Professor Mihal Noginov and Professor Jabu Kogin. He said, we have a, a long standing question debated among the nanophotonics community is whether size matters and helps to reduce the threshold of one micrometer and sub micrometer size and lasers and whether the presence of a metal interfacing the gain medium harms or improves the laser performance. And we uh, solve this question, to, like we show the high performance based on this plasmonic effect. And then we, uh, last year, we, I wrote a review paper with my colleague Rupert Upton to discuss the applications of nanolasers. We solved the intrinsic merits of the nanolasers based on the, their capability to simultaneously localize the light field in frequency, in time, and in space. And this gives us a, a, a number of uh, 
advantages for medical application. For example, um, if the device can be smaller and the, the kind of power consumption can be very low, this is especially important for photonic integration and the optical interconnect. And secondly, uh, we will have a very strong field inside a nano laser because right now uh, we have uh, still can have the uh, marriage like with a very, very small water volume. But now we have this laser enhanced like remnants. We have this uh, enhanced Q compared, comparing to the uh, passive like plasmonic sensing. See, we have an even higher QOV. This is uh, particularly important for near field spectroscopy and sensing. So last part, that part is about uh, Motor engineering because we have a very limited cavity mode now, and uh, we can do the IG mode uh, engineering over there, like I discussed uh, in revealing the mission dimension, uh, also the topological bulk lasers. I think, like, like think about uh, one day, like we drive a car, like or take a, a spaceship to the vast and uh, wide like uh, universe, like what we want to take with us, and then probably we, uh, there's a lot of things we want to take out with, uh, with us. And in this movie of Ant-Man, they have this uh, advanced content technology that can transform the whole building in a very small like uh, box. So we don't have this uh, this kind of technology yet, but I think the nano scale the kind of, of the devices, the advanced the nano technology we now right now can have us not only like uh, to like uh, have the high performance device, or like uh, we can do something uh, like uh, very interesting in physics. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, thank my collaborators and the students and the postdocs, and especially um, uh, Yifei, uh, Huazhou, uh, and also Zheng Kai and uh, Zheng Qian, like uh, uh, Yifei and uh, uh, Zheng Kai are postdocs in my group right now, they are working very hard and very brilliant. And also uh, another student named Hong Yi has uh, also uh, uh, demonstrated that kind of revealing our missing dimension work. Also, I need to thank the uh, two alumni from my group, Dr. So Wang and uh, Dr. Xinyuan Wang, uh, who are uh, involved in that uh, scanning of plasmonic uh, laser um, of work. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. OK, great. Yeah, uh, so uh, let me congratulations for your wonderful talk. Here we have some questions. Yeah, uh, the first question is for the nano laser. So you have a one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. So for the three dimension, does the side wall, the profile will affect the you know performance? Um, yes, that three dimension is uh, it's the most of the challenges one actually. Um, yeah, the it's uh, the interface is very important. So I think that's a big. That's uh, one of the reasons it's very hard to demonstrate electrically driven uh, like uh, devices in all this kind of three-dimensional confined uh, like uh, structure. But uh, uh, it can be solved. Like uh, already, uh, Martin Hill's group already demonstrated, and also Professor Ning's group at the Ariana and the Tsinghua University uh, also tried demonstrated like uh, this kind of interface problems can be like partially solved and uh, to demonstrate uh, like uh, electrically driven even. Uh, uh, like for this three dimensional confined device. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, we came to the next question. This question is about uh, uh, as we all know, the energy state are immune to the defect and they are protected by the bound topology. And the condensed bulk model be protected by bound topology, showing better stability. Ah, that's a, a, a very good question. So yes, people are interested in topological isolate because it is kind of a, a, like a symmetry uh, protected or time will also symmetry protected or like in our uh, structure it's kind of a crystal symmetry protected. So that's the edge state. So that in that uh, fixed review uh, letter paper, like uh, the topological vortex laser, we are utilizing this kind of a topological edge state mode. Actually, we really surprised at the beginning, we saw it can be like, cannot be kind of that kind of ideal. Like uh, we have like two modes, uh, CCW mode and CW mode. If there is any coupling, we will see a standing wheel inside the, the, the cavity. You see that we, we, we utilize this kind of X shaped uh, like a cavity. So not like a, like a, wrong, uh, like a ring shaped cavity and we dot with this kind of very less uh, like a scattering. This axis with a lot of sharp corners, we, we didn't see any like a scattering back 
back scattering from this edge state. So that's demonstrated the vastness of this topological edge state. So back to the bulk states, the, interesting, you know, the most interesting thing is the bulk states give us a nature of a modal selection. So even for that uh, edge state, like uh, if you carry the size a lot, you still have like a number of modes inside the over there. You still will have like kind of a modal competition and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a different uh, issue. Uh, or, although you have like it's kind of back scattering uh, free like uh, edge state, but for uh, bulk modes, like uh, our device is kind of with a diameter about a seven uh, micrometer. That's so many modes inside the over there but uh, we can achieve very stable single mode lasing over there. This is because the band inversion induced refraction only happen at the gamma point. So only at that very narrow frequency range, we will have this refraction. So the robustness of this bulk laser comes from uh, this, come from this uh, very narrow frequency uh, like a uh, 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 refraction. Okay, cool. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. I, actually, I have to choose some. Okay, yeah, I choose this one. Uh, since the reflection is based on the inverse photon, uh, photonic crystal bond, will this mechanism still work when the act, uh, cavity became smaller? Or there is not enough collagen cells to form the phot uh, photonic bond? So this, yeah. That's an excellent question, actually. That's a very good question. So we are working on, on that topic now to see how small can do. So like uh, if you make a device really small, you will not have this band concept because I mean the band needs a uh, priority that you have, you need a lot of uh, uh, like a unit cell to construct this priority to get this band structure and to construct the, the concept of uh, like a topological or like a, a trivial photonic crystal. But if you make a device really small, that you do not have that band or the concept of the band anymore. But we see recently from our experiments, we see some very interesting feature. Even without that concept, we, we, we still can get some interesting results. Uh, I, I hope I can share with you like a soon um, on that uh, like a kind of thing. Okay. okay, yeah, we do have still have some questions, but I will send to you later. Okay, yeah, I have a, the last question from myself. So, uh, Renmin, yeah, you have uh, been done, uh, you know, long term, yeah, since your PhD, there was a sticker in the one field, so developing, developing, to many new things come out. So, can you tell us something, you know, how you found all this topic, you know? In the same area, how you developing all this, you know, new topic? How you got all these new ideas? Okay, that's a, a very good question. So I need to think about it. So um, I think uh, one thing I, I I I want to highlight, although I I, I probably in you know, a short I cannot give a very uh, precise answer like. So I think like to um, working on a thing like for a long period it really helps like because with your understanding uh, on that topic and better and better you will like get a, like a, so even like a, um, the same topic you say like felt like a, sometimes like a, um, probably there's not too many new stuff over there but like a, I think the most important thing is the depth of uh, the understanding on that topic that it really helps. Okay, I, I hope that I. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Answer the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I think most of our students will be want to hear you know your stories later. So we have a lot of chance. Okay. Yeah, we are really proud of have you here. And I can act always. You know. Yeah, have the best speaker and I have the best. You know, uh, the results. So congratulations, Jamie. This is a certification for you. Connect world and universe by your technology. And uh, so the, I give that to you, the electrical version. Then I met you in person, I will give you the hard copies. Okay, <laughs> okay I will look forward to that. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so yeah, we move to the last speaker. Yeah, Chen Lei Guo. So Professor Yongfeng Lu will be the host. So Professor Yongfeng, yeah, are you ready to introduce? Yeah, okay, Professor Guo, yeah. please. Thank you, Alice, and I'm really impressed by the talk uh, by uh, Renmin, and he's young and promising. And hopefully, you know, we can get a, another Nobel Prize uh, in the uh, laser areas. I think that's not a dream. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Chun Lei Guo uh, from uh, University of Rochester, U.S. So 
So um, I had a pleasure to know Chen Li from a, a long time ago. I still remember that uh, we first met in uh, in Photonics West. That's uh, 2004 or 2003. That's uh, almost 18 years ago. That time Chen Li uh, was a very young and energetic um, uh, new faculty. Now he's becoming very uh, achieved and known in the field. Um, so Chen has a lot of achievements. So in order to you know, give him more time, so I just uh, uh, skip some of the details. But he is in um, Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester, which is uh, you know, um, uh, probably one of the top ones, if not top one uh, in US and uh, also leading one in the, in the world in, in terms of optics. And um, uh, Chen Li uh, uh, was also a funding member of, uh, funding director of the joint uh, laboratory between uh, US and China at Chen uh, uh, for Optics and Mechanics and Physics. So Chen Li has uh, many um, achievements and uh, scientifically, he uh, is a fellow of uh, American uh, Physical Society and uh, Optical Society of America. Both are a refreshing of, uh, of his uh, scientific achievements. And also China has uh, done a lot of more applied research in the area of uh, uh, functionalization of uh, materials, which has uh, attracted a tremendous amount of uh, attention, uh, not in the scientific community, but also from general public. Um, you know, his work has been uh, featured by many public and media like in newspapers and uh, very uh, major uh, TV uh, stations in the US, like I remember CNN and ABC uh, featured the journalist's work. Uh, and his um, um, work has also contributed to the, uh, I think globally, um, I think China has one program uh, project is to develop a new toilet in 